that people of uh, both parties, people of both houses, Senate and House, can work together on issues of common uh, agreement, the things that we can come together on. Uh, the, our first responsibility is to balance the budget. The second responsibility is to create jobs. And obviously, a third responsibility, which we're charged in the Constitution, is to create an environment for learning. And we've, the, the Democrats and Republicans have come together and put together a package of bills which are jointly committed to uh, see passing uh, this year. And we're going to begin by hearing from first uh, Senator Rob Garagiola. Senator Garagiola. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, as a Senate Majority Leader, it's my pleasure to stand here to support these bills. Uh, the bills help protect our children, educate our families, provide increased opportunities for job growth in the tech sector, and also enable uh, our church family institutions to be passed on generation to generation. Uh, it's only a sampling of some of the bipartisan legislation we're going to be working on this session. Um, these bills work for all Marylanders in regards to where you live, your political affiliation, or income level. It's legislation that affects our families uh, uh, and, and all of our families, uh, regardless of rather rural, urban, uh, suburbs, Eastern Shore, Western Maryland, Washington, uh, D.C. area. We have a team that's committed to work on these pieces of legislation, and with that I'd like to introduce Senator Catherine Pugh. Good morning, everybody. Let me just say that we're all Democrats here together, and we have an agenda that we have to work on. We're going to move Maryland forward. Um, we know that there are a lot of questions as it relates to taxes and so forth, but we also understand that we have to be conscious of the diversity of the state. We want to make sure that we're inclusionary. We're concerned about pushing education and making sure that education remains in the forefront of our agenda. Uh, we've got to make sure that we continue to push and make sure that all of the children in our state are well educated. We're trying to prepare for the future whether it's biotechnology, whether it's the healthcare industry, we've got to make sure that we're supplying the workforce for the state of Maryland. And so we're going to continue to work together. We know these are very tough times. We're going to call on each and every one of us. You know, some of us are going to have to make some sacrifices. Some of us are going to have to take some really hard votes. But at the same time, we just want to make sure that the state understands the diversity in terms of where the state has come to. Uh, we have a, a great uh, minority community. We've got a community that is eager to be, participate, and so we're going to be inclusive, and we look forward to working with each and every last one of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, folks, uh, also, we have a number of uh, Republican members here, but uh, we'll let them talk in a minute. But what we're going to do is bring up Senator Kittleman right now. Where's Senator Kittleman? Right here. Okay, Senator Kittleman and, and uh, De Delegate Kaiser and Senator McFadden. One of the most important issues that we have to deal with is, is, is educating our youngsters. And uh, last year, the Department of Education uh, eliminated high school assessment tests for, uh, for civics, for government, uh, for history. And uh, we, we were all taught reading, writing, arithmetic, but we were also taught about government and history. And that's what inspired a number of us to uh, go into government. And uh, we've got a bill that's going to uh, bring that back, not the test, but we're going to bring it back. We also have Scott McComb from uh, the History Department here in Calgary County, we're going to, and also a lady from Common Cause. But first of all, we're going to hear from these uh, prominent legislators, starting with uh, Senator Kittleman. Thank you Kittleman. very much, Mr. President. It's an honor to be here with you and with others. Uh, I serve on the Social Studies Advisory Council, as well as a chairman of the Civic Literacy Commission in, in Maryland. And, and we have learned and, and that we really need to focus on, on government education in Maryland. And we need to focus that in all three levels, not just in high school. We need to focus it on it in elementary school, in middle school, and in high school. And we know we're not going to get the test back. The Senate President said that. But we really think it's important that, that social studies and government be included in the common core that's looked at it by the Maryland State Department of Education. And then we make sure that things are public, make sure that there is assessments in all three levels. And that's what this bill does. It encourages folks to know about their government. And, you know, as much as I think it's important for science and language and reading and math, if you don't understand how your government works, if you don't understand the rights that you have as citizens, it's really hard to have a free republic. And so I really support this bill. I appreciate the Senate President and the other delegates and senators, and I look forward to working on it. Thank you, and just honored and happy to be able to support this very bipartisan effort. I'm a teacher of social studies and history in the Baltimore City Public Schools for over 40 years. Taught government. It's essential, it's important. In the global world that we live in, in a world that's increasingly shrinking, it's important that our citizens understand our history. We had an adage, I taught it uh, in middle and in high school. If you 
fail to learn your history, you're doomed to repeat it. It's essential, it's important, and it's something that I'm very glad that the president, uh, the majority leader, and the minority leader have come together to support this very worthwhile and much needed effort. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, it's good for the House of Delegates to join Senator Miller and all the other leaders in this room to work on this social studies legislation. I think much that's already been said that is so important. I think, again, that uh, enhancing our social studies instruction helps with civic engagement. It helps with global awareness. It helps with, helps with our civic literacy. And I look forward to working with others for all the reasons already stated of this important legislation. Thank you. Okay, Susan Whitman, Common Cause, and also Scott McComb, uh, Department of History, Calvary County, please come forward on this important issue. Hi, I want to thank all of the, the leaders in the General Assembly who have supported this. Common Cause is an organization that works for um, good government, for transparent and open government. But we also work on issues that really go to the core foundation of our democracy. And having an educated electorate and citizens that know how to engage in, um, with their government and understand the issues that um, they have to vote on and that are being decided is critical to having a solid democracy. So we believe that it's critically important for Maryland to make sure that its students are educated so that they graduate as adults ready to fully engage in their democracy. Good morning. Uh, I'm Scott McComb and I'm with the Maryland Council for Social Studies. Um, up until about a decade ago, uh, Social studies was always considered one of the four core content areas. That was true in any statewide standard setting, and it was true in all assessment programs. And then with the advent of No Child Left Behind, something changed, and social studies became marginalized. Um, and this was a choice, and I need to make that clear. Other states, like Virginia, chose to maintain their social studies assessment programs, but Maryland, an educational leader in the nation, dropped theirs. And immediately we saw the marginalization of social studies. So much so that Dr. Nancy Grasmick in 2004 commissioned the creation of a social studies task force. We have copies of this task force report. Suffice to say they found some pretty startling statistics, many more than I can list here today. But I will tell you that among those, it was found that social studies lost more instructional time in elementary school than any other discipline, including art, music, physical education. One in four middle school teachers reported that the amount of time they had allotted for social studies was decreased. That across the state today, middle school social studies is more likely to be taught by an untrained teacher than any other discipline. And students in high poverty areas have seen the greatest reduction in instructional time. Many of these students at the elementary level receive no, no daily social studies instruction. So the bill that we're talking about today helps us solve these problems. It has one main focus, and that is return social studies to its rightful, rightful place as one of the four core content areas. I encourage you to take a look at the task force report and its recommendations. I, I uh, have to stress to you that it is MSDE's uh, task force. It is their report, and the recommendations, including uh, the inclusion of social studies and assessment program, are made within this report. Thank you. One of the areas of unanimity we're going to find this, this session in terms of uh, cutting taxes is uh, with regard to uh, farmland uh, that's passing from one generation to another. You know, when a, when a farm, when a person who owns a farm passes, so often the farm is lost to uh, congestion and to sprawl. Uh, agriculture continues to be the number one business in the state of Maryland. Uh, if you have a, a family farm and the children grew up on the farm, there's often a great tendency for the children to stay on the farm and to protect the environment. Um, to talk about this issue, we're going to bring forth uh, Senator Ron Young, who brought this uh, issue forward last year, and continues to push this issue this year. And also, we're going to bring up, uh, to show unanimity, stand behind him, we're going to have uh, two gentlemen uh, of different parties, uh, both contesting for the same position in Western Maryland. Uh, <laughs> Senator Brinkley, come on up here, and Senator Garagiola. They're going to stand behind him. and. Uh, and uh, all three are going to talk about uh, why it's important to save the family farms. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Before I uh, begin, as a former political science major and, and teacher, I'd like to jump on and agree with what was said uh, previously. And as a former mayor, I naturally had uh, most interest in urban areas. But 
Frederick County is the largest county in the state, and we have a huge amount of farmland which we're seeing lost each year. And it's become very difficult to pass the farm from father to son or father to daughter or even from one owner to, to the next because of the taxes imposed on it. So this bill is uh, excluding the tax on farmland up to $5 million and then reducing the amount from 16 to 5% above that so that the farm can stay in farming and can be actively uh, farmed in the future, which is the major interest in, in the bill. Uh, Non-farm items will still be taxed at 16% uh, over a million dollars, but the farmland taxes will be greatly reduced. And hopefully, uh, in addition to keeping farming alive, it's also one of the best land protection uh, policies. If we keep the land in farming, we're protecting it from development. But uh, most important of all, we want to keep our farmers active. It's still, I believe, the major uh, employer in the state, farmlands across the state. We need to protect and preserve that. Good morning. Thanks for being here. This is a, ve this is a very important first step for what we see on some of the estate tax uh, issues that are coming up, not just with the ag community, but uh, you know, with the whole business community. Uh, you know, I'm pleased to be on this. The, in my professional world, I do estate planning for people too. And we have to keep in mind that this is just one step. We have other businesses that, we, that I'm going to also have another bill on that you know, some people will sign on to, but that will deal with estate uh, preservation for all businesses that are here. But the best farm preservation program we can have is anything that enables the farm to be profitable. People that make farming their lifestyle, and it certainly is a lifestyle choice, because from an investment point of view, some of the returns are risky at best, and sometimes even then marginal. But you know, it's a lifestyle choice, and anything that we can do to enable an orderly transition uh, you know, of the family farm to later generations is anything that's going to, to improve farming. You know, Senator Kittleman's family by experience, uh, they dealt with that issue uh, in, in trying to preserve their farm and having to pay the taxes there. Um, so I'm very pleased to be a part of this. And again, like I say, it's one step. It's funny. I, too, have a bill just like his. <laughs> Deal with small businesses. It's pretty uh, interesting. Um, ha half the area of my, uh, of my district uh, is, is agriculture. And I'm talking about my state senate district. Uh, it's, it's um, there's a lot of farming interest in Upper Montgomery County. I have about two thirds of the uh, ag reserve in Montgomery County, and I hear this from a number in the, the farming and the agricultural community, where they're land rich but cash poor. And so when the parents decease uh, and the state taxes come, there's not a means to pay for those estate taxes. And oftentimes, what happens is a portion of the farm, or all of the farm, uh, ends up getting sold to development. Uh, Senate President talked about congestion and sprawl. That's what ends up happening at these family farms. This is probably one of the greatest uh, uh, land preservation tools that we have in the toolbox if we can get this legislation enacted. And I'm very pleased that it's part of our package. It's bipartisan. We're all working together on it, and hopefully we'll get it to the governor's desk this session. Glad you could come on Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, another bill we're going to deal with is identity theft. Uh, it's become very, very... Uh, uh, too common for, for, for our young children to have their identity stolen for some before they're even able to walk, some before they're able to accumulate debt of their own, and we have a bill to protect that. Senator Assel is a principal sponsor, but because of his father's passing, he will not be able to be here. We're going to have uh, Delegate uh, Zucker and first of all, Senator Kathy Klausmark come up and explain the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we, we, we have had the opportunity to talk about social studies and farming and uh, but child safety for identity theft is uh, very, very prevalent. Uh, One percent of the adults in this country, or I guess in this world, uh, have identity theft. Ten percent of children do. Sometimes it's even babies five months old that have their identity taken away through the social through their social security numbers, and it is very very important that we pass this legislation because what happens if an, if an adult tries to find out their credit report on their child, 
uh, that goes against them. So, and when I say it goes against them, but in the end, uh, when they actually get their credit scores, when they're old enough, their credit scores are not all that good because the parents called too many times, which is ridiculous. So I think we're really going to work on this, and I'm going to let Delegate Sucker say a few words, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today as the House sponsor of this great legislation on the House side. I want to thank uh, Senator Miller, Senator Astle, and Senator Klausmar for their outstanding leadership on this issue. I also uh, want to thank more than 30 of my colleagues on the House side who have co-sponsored this legislation in a bipartisan way. Uh, with the economy being the way it is today, uh, it's easy to realize that a, a good credit score is important when it comes to purchasing a home, uh, obtaining a loan. And, uh, you know, today when I was leaving my house, I grabbed off my dresser a picture of my son, who's two and a half years old, a picture of his class. And when I was looking at it, I realized these are children who are trying to establish their own identities, becoming their own people. And uh, I'm thinking when they become the certain age that they can establish their own credit, let it be the identity that they created for themselves and not the identity that was created for them through the means of fraud. And this is, this is a national issue, as the senator was mentioning. Over 140,000 children throughout the United States have had their identities stolen each year. And this is an opportunity for us to let our children in the state of Maryland start with a clean slate and make sure that it, they have every shot of being uh, successful. I look forward to working with my colleagues in the Senate and the House to trying to make sure that we continue to protect the most vulnerable in our state. Thank you. We also have uh, the head of the Consumer Protection Division from the Attorney General's Office, Mr. Steve Sokomoto. Wengel, please. Mr. Wengel. Um, thank you very much, President Miller. Um, the Attorney General's Office is very concerned about identity theft and also very concerned about protecting children in Maryland. And we believe this measure will help to prevent children from becoming victims of identity theft. Um, we look forward to working with um, Delka Zucker, with President Miller, with Senators Klaus Meyer and Astle on getting this important law enacted and uh, hope to be able to protect Maryland children from becoming victims of identity theft. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, in part of our job creation package, we have Senator Roger Mano. We're Senator Mano. Uh, he's going to explain why it's important to uh, have people who can afford to take jobs because of security clearances. Senator Mano. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good morning. Uh, the message behind our, the security clearance bill that we're introducing uh, today is that Maryland is open for business. And uh, for the vast number of federal and state contractors um, of a high security, IT, defense, uh, uh, high tech nature, uh, we're making a sizable investment uh, this morning in those workers, in those contractors, uh, by creating a tax credit to assist them in expediting security clearances. As many of you know, uh, we represent across the state, not just in the D.C. metro uh, area that I represent in Montgomery County, but also in, for example, Senator DeGrange's uh, uh, area uh, with NSA and, and uh, Fort Meade, um, a huge number of jobs, of potential jobs, uh, and we want to ensure that those jobs are going to Maryland workers and that those workers have the tools that they need, the opportunities uh, that we can give them to be successful, to compete for those jobs. And uh, the challenge is providing some assistance on the state level uh, in being able to apply for and expedite those security clearances. As you may know, they're extremely expensive. Uh, and uh, those who are able to, to obtain those clearances are at a huge competitive advantage uh, over other workers. So again, uh, Maryland is open for business. We're making an investment and a statement today as to um, the kind of businesses that we want to see in the state of Maryland uh, for the next 50 years. Highly skilled, high paying jobs uh, uh, with critical uh, strategic applications for the federal government. Uh, in the, both the public and the private sector, and I think that this bill will go a long way in, uh, in doing that. So thank you. Okay. Lastly, but not least, I mean, these bills have both Republican and Democratic sponsors, and uh, we want to congratulate and thank this. You see an array here of Democrat and Republican members that, uh, that feel that these bills are important. Let me bring up uh, Senator Garagiola, 
Uh, if, if let's explain this last bill, why we, we want to recognize our veterans, especially those who are serving in a, a, Afghanistan and Iraq, and also the head of the Veterans Caucus, uh, Senator Peters. And, um, sorry, Fulber, why don't you come up here and say <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we presently have uh, uh, a law on the books providing scholarship for those veterans returning from Afghanistan and Iraq, and it's a scholarship that provides them 50% off of their tuition uh, for institutions of higher education. And it's applicable for them, uh, their children, as well as their spouses. Uh, it's an incredible program that's been on the books. It has a sunset that's coming up. And what this legislation does is it extends that sunset an additional four years. Obviously, these conflicts are going on a lot longer than many had uh, anticipated. Uh, we've drawn out of Iraq. We're still in Afghanistan. Uh, since 2009, the last three years alone, uh, there have been over 357 awardees with 1.9 million in scholarship funds. Uh, these veterans and their families are sacrificing so much to serve this country, and uh, I feel this is the least we can do to make sure that they have leg up and getting a higher education and be able to move up that economic ladder themselves. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the chair of the Veterans Caucus, uh, Senator Peters. Thank you, Senator Garagiola, and I'd like to commend my colleagues in the Senate and the House for being a very veteran-friendly group. And we have in our, our lieutenant governor, a full colonel, who is the highest ranking reserve officer in the United States who's serving in the executive office. Uh, this is a bill that says thank you to the veterans. I know we celebrate Veterans Day every year. Every year we mourn the loss of all those killed in action in Maryland. But these are the kind of things that really extend our hand to the veterans. The other day we had a press conference about HF, HFAM who are extending jobs to veterans. They're making veterans a priority to hire. This is another bill that will go further. So I thank the General Assembly for introducing this bill. A nation, a state that forgets its veterans will itself one day be forgotten. Let us never forget our veterans. Thank you. Folks, that concludes our press conference. Uh, basically, I, we just want to show that it contrasts with what's happening in Washington, D.C. Honestly and truly, this is, we're, we're of the people, by the people, and for the people. We're local people. We go home every night. Uh, we have jobs outside the General Assembly. We understand the problems that there, our constituents are facing. And we're coming together as best we can. We're not going to be able to agree on everything. But the things we can agree upon, uh, we're going to bring forward and pass and hope to solve uh, some of our problems uh, in the state, especially in terms of creating jobs, providing education, and balancing the budget. Thank you. God bless you.